Okay, welcome to the February 20th meeting of the Zoning Subcommittee. Uh, this meeting is being recorded for later broadcast by Amherst Media. Are there any other announcements? Minutes, do we have minutes? Yes. Oh yes, okay. Um, Um, it's a little more brief than we're used to, but it seems like it covers it anyway. Um, is there a motion on minutes? I move that we accept or approve the minutes of February 13th, 2013. Okay. I'll second it. And is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? Uh, Abstaining, okay. I wasn't here. Yeah. <laughs> and are you going to handle it today? Uh, no, Steve said he'd do you it can do it again? Yes. Yeah. Oh, nice. He, he enjoyed it so much, he's going to do it again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like this. Well, mine are short stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, tonight um, we have public hearings for the Main and Gray Street rezoning and also for the uh, converted dwellings uh, fix. So um, if we wish, we probably should um, provide a recommendation to the planning board. Um, so let's let's uh, let's get right to those and hopefully get these out of the way quickly. Uh, Main and Gray Street rezoning we have it's just a simple change of two parcels from one zone to another, and we got a nice analysis from the planning department. Um, I I think it's the analysis is all we really need. It's that's that's the uh, report as far as I'm concerned. So. <clears throat> um, does anyone have any comments about uh, the proposal? Questions or? Go ahead. Um, I did on the um, the analysis sheet, which I assume will will um, evolve into the report to town meeting. So I don't know if we want to get into. I'm just yeah, let's let's okay. Okay. yeah okay. Bring, um, bring it up. What, what, what do you okay. um, <clears throat> um the community, I would just uh, for the, I would just say community intent instead of overall community intent. And then, the section that's titled historic preservation, I might. Uh, there's a couple of bullet points that I would pull out that aren't necessarily preservation, and it may be the background or the history of the parcels or recent history. And then, historic preservation, um, maybe keep that with some of the bullets so for example um, I would say on this um, what's the second bullet instead of st I would say town meeting previously attempted to purchase these two lots using CPA historic preservation funds um, that effort failed whatever and then um, development on the property could be kept to the east any new develop um, that seemed like a different point or a sighting point. So I was trying to, uh, just something struck me that it wasn't just historic preservation, that we're really trying to give the background of the site or maybe, uh, and then some of it is related to the, the new historic local local district. So um, I don't exactly have it right, but I just thought we could um, give the background first and then have a section on uh, maybe even reorder reorder some of these, um, but okay. I do support the change. Um, any response from staff? Um, the reason for the third hmm. bullet under historic preservation was to indicate that if that the historic preservation, and we could, this could be said differently, the historic preservation purpose all along, or in recent years for these two properties was to maintain view of from the street of the uh, Henry Hills mansion and the point uh, it has come up on in a number of instances and it came up 
um, during the discussion of the purchase of the lots, that if development occurred there, one of the things that, you know, sort of between no development and, and complete development, there was an alternative to say that you could push the whatever it was to the east and south and still maintain a fairly substantial view, which was the point of the exercise uh, of the mansion. Um, I don't necessarily care where that goes. That could go down below under depot center development. I guess the reason I, I'm concerned about that is I just think on balance it may get people, it, it, it may suggest that there's uh, kind of a historic preservation agenda yeah. still to be dealt with with this issue and mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make it a little bit more neutral. Um, it sure sounds like there's an unfinished agenda, like some people wanted this for historic <clears throat> preservation, but we couldn't get it, so now we have a zoning change, and I just... Well, it's, if I may, part of, the, part of the purpose of this is to provide context, because there are those people out there, there are people who want nothing at all to happen on these properties, and there are other people who don't care about the historic preservation, they want, want them to be reasonably developed as part of that new center there and <clears throat> what this does is, is simply make people aware that there's some a point somewhere in between it doesn't have to be all one or all the other and i think um additionally it's um there, there's currently two lots and presumably both lots could be developed independently the proposal is to develop it as, as a single lot and therefore you could keep it to the east that's that's also part of the idea although that obviously that's not guaranteed I, my inclination is to be silent on where the building should be and leave that to the local historic yeah, yeah. district just because I'm, I can see arguments, urban design arguments either way. Um, and, uh, you know, especially the one lot two, uh, well, then if it's two lots, maybe we want something different to frame a view between buildings or, mm -hmm. yeah. And this almost promises that. Yeah. And the lots aren't that big. No, it's you, not. <laughs> So when they get down to the details, I'll put more on that. Yeah, just the other thing is the <clears throat> second bullet seems a little, um, maybe a little chatty. In other <clears throat> words, that town meeting approved the appraisal of it. But is it all of that public knowledge that the owner? Yes, I have said, said so at town meeting. Um, <clears throat> this could be rephrased. Um, um, but, but in other words, these are owners that are trying to get, you know, trying to get, well, make this property. Essentially what they invest, so they're trying to get what they invested in it. Although that, yeah, that so we didn't want to say that, but. Yeah. <clears throat> so I might just ask that as this gets redrafted that we get, oh, yeah. we or the full oh, board yeah. get another look at, because I think I, <clears throat> I, under, I appreciate what you're trying to do and tell the story and give all the information. So people don't feel like something was hidden, but just. I'm sure it's not sort of trying to slant it one way or another way or uh. even if there could be an exact quote on what was said to town meeting if if this would not pass and it remains RG uh, I know it says it could be residential development but what sort would it be a single family could, home or an apartment could, building in general residence you could have single family homes on the two lots. That's the, the sort of the threat option. Uh, you could combine the properties and propose uh, multi-unit residential development under a special permit, whether that's an apartment or a townhouse or you know, a large duplex. Um, there are any number of options. You can also do nonprofit educational institutions, and in fact, that, that has been one of the, the uh, potential uses for some time and when Amherst Media came along and they started to explore this in greater detail one of the things that they and this is noted elsewhere here discovered that if if the zoning is RG then the dimensions presume a residential use and it's not very advantageous uh, in terms of uh, developing a nonprofit building like a facility for Amherst Media for instance or any other uh, kind and so with part of the intent at least under the scheme that the property owners and Amherst Media are, are pursuing is to rezone it so that the dimensions, the use would still be allowed, um, but so that the dimensions would be more advantageous in terms of putting a building on the property. There wouldn't have to be a particular setback that would be appropriate for a home, less, not, for, be less not for a building. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Okay. Larger lot coverage. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's really help. It's really help help helpful to be going through this. But maybe the starting place is to describe what's there now, what the zoning allows, what the request is, and what that would then allow. And not not even say you know they need it. This would be advantageous to them, or they might need. Just say the change being requested would allow or would change these dimensions, and sort of give people a start off with kind of a review of the zoning. Uh, what can you do now? What can you do with the change? And and maybe uh, let people then then can evaluate that more for themselves. Size of the, give the size of the parcels. Any also, that I would assume there'd have to be if if they were developed as housing lots, there'd have to be driveways for each one, which would be disruptive to the sidewalk that was just built, and so that might be mentioned too, perhaps. In a general manner, we didn't prepare, and, um, and I take responsibility for not doing this, we didn't prepare a uh, comparison of, of the use regulations between the RG district and the BN district, but um, partly because we're familiar with it because we just dealt with it. Um, but the BN district is a transitional district. It is meant to allow for a small sort of neighborhood scale business activities. Um, even those activities that are allowed in many cases have restrictions on hours, number of employees, that sort of thing. It's a way of dampening it down. So it's, it's not as uh, you know, uh, wide open as, for instance, the Village Center Business District right across the street here, um, and certainly not as wide open as commercial or um, anything like that. But it, it does allow a wider range of uses than does the general residence district, which is intended to be principally a dense residential district. Um, it, was there any, I don't know if, if uh, the petitioners consulted with uh, the planning department before suggesting BN, was there any thought given to B, VC? And not, that I'm, uh, not that I'm suggesting, I'm just wondering. I think they were going for um, what they thought they needed to accomplish their their intended purposes. Uh, it's also immediately adjacent on the same side of the street. If you look at the map, uh, the neighborhood business district is right across the street in, on Gray Street, and this would simply be a, a continuation of that. And it's also a sort of a, a remembering that the proponent in this, this case has owned or developed the residential properties to the north this has less would have less impact on those than would a village center business district mm -hmm. designation. Okay. Do we need to vote to? We don't need recommend? to, but, we, but if we want to, we, we can. I would I would recommend that, that this be um, approved for the planning board to well, however you would say that they, this go onto the planning board for approval. Okay. Yeah. Is that a motion? Is there a second or? Go ahead. Second. No, after you. Yes, <laughs> you behind me. That's what it was. <laughs> I yield to Closer. the senator. From okay. Is there any further discussion? I, do, I just oh, wonder if we should, in the dis I, my second stands, but um, do we want to articulate for the planning board why we recommend that the board? I mean, I think we've sort of said it in different pieces, but maybe we could give two or three reasons why we recommend there. Okay. Um, well, I, I think it's a nice compliment to the neighborhood, and, and I certainly think it would be better to have it developed in some way in that sense, and I, I can't imagine two houses being built there. It doesn't seem to make sense on a commercial street. Okay, so a better... Better use of the use space, of the yes. Better zone, okay. Is that okay? Anybody else? I think pretty much covers it. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Do you want to say anything about its response to the uh, neighborhood center across the street? What it, one of the things that it does is that it creates, hmm. we noted this in the analysis, it creates a, a double loaded street, mm -hmm. which is a very advantageous thing in terms of uh, center development. Well, it would add more vitality. Sure, we could put that in, sure. Hmm. Say it's consistent with the other business and com uh, commercial and retail uses uh, 
across the street. Okay. All in favor of the motion to recommend it to the planning board? Okay. I'm sorry, who seconded? I seconded. And that's a 4 0 vote. Okay. <coughs> um, the article on converted dwellings. Um, this simply corrects uh, overlap that happened in the last town meeting, deletes the uh, one that, the, that was intended to be superseded and, and it uh, offers some clarifying language in the, in the existing uh, one, the part that we're keeping about who is allowed to, um, or who is supposed to manage the a property that is a converted dwelling. Um, is there any discussion about this one? <laughs> no, is there a motion? Or we can just I, let we it can go. discuss after, but I guess my my question is, in, you know, the ongoing presence of is is that I mean it seems a little amorphous, so that might be good, or it's a little amorphous, so it might not be good enough. And, uh, are we setting ourselves up for something that we can't really? Um, so, and maybe you folks have discussed it prior, but what is the on, what's the ongoing presence of? Somebody's there, there all the time. I, I think, if I, as I recollect, this was in response to people being concerned that there is a resident manager for 500 units, and that he or she would just be stopping by occasionally instead of pres being present all the time. I'm fine with just leaving it here, but I, I just personally, I don't think it tells us anything. And I think it was trying to be responsive to people's concerns, but I think it's one of those kind of, it's a throwaway clause. And I'm okay with leaving it, but I think. I mean, you would rather see it just be qualified resident? No, I don't even know what, uh, yeah, qualified. I, I, so. I guess I feel like just personally, I'm not, I'm not sure this is the way to get at the problem and then we're coming up with, does that mean they're, th they're there once a day or their bed is there or they don't go on there's vacation too much? <coughs> I mean, I just. There's a definition of resident manager that was added to the bylaw in the fall and it, it I think ongoing presence just, if anything, it's superfluous. It adds emphasis to the fact that they live there. Excuse me. Would, would striking that clause and saying a qualified resident, because the, the resident manager, is that enough? Would you keep in one of the units, which follows? Well, I think we. That's already. We kind of are bound yeah. to that at this yeah. point. Yeah. So it just it was more the new language that I think we were really looking at. So. Um, that's. I don't think it make, makes a difference to me. Uh, you, you, no, just the uh, the idea like. Two week vacation, four week vacation. So, do you want to recommend it without that language or recommend it either way, depending on, on what the planning board wants? <clears throat> well, we're, we're kind of adding, um, so we're adding immeasurable things to an immeasurable thing. In other words, in a way, we all know what we mean. We mean somebody that lives there, resident mm -hmm. manager. So, In some ways, the more descriptors you get, the easier it is for somebody to find the loopholes. So in other words, like if we owner-occupant, we know what that means, but if we said the ongoing presence of an owner-occupant, then that might give somebody an idea of, oh, they only, <laughs> that, yeah, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're getting at. I'm not, I, I'm not sure what the loophole is, but, but I agree that there might be one there somewhere. <laughs> does it really dilute it at all to just take out that phrase and say owner occupancy or, uh, a, qualified or, resident or a qualified resident manager. It does not, I don't think. Then I would go with the more sparse and specific language. I would even tend to just <laughs> leave all the to just resident manager because. Well, that was yeah. what the petitioners asked for. So, so they must be qualified, what? That was what the petitioners asked for. This is, the qualified is our language, it's not the petitioner's language, so. <laughs> You're right. 
Oh, I thought they wanted qualified because they were afraid a student would be appointed as a resident. But they manager. didn't. They didn't move it. They, they moved. They moved the language that's that's not in. If, if I may, um, the two the two actions were taken separately, yep. and there really wasn't that much cross fertilization between them at last the full time meeting. Uh, however, in staff, in looking at the two sections that were affected here, uh, section six and section thirteen, saw that section thirteen used the words, the ongoing services of a qualified professional property management company, the pr presence of a qualified on-site resident manager. This was your language from last time. And so at a minimum qualification, the mention of, of qualification seemed to be a threshold that was important to have in there. I should mention that um, staff have met with the Zoning Board of Appeals, which has been working on trying to figure out, well, okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, we're, we're gonna have to implement it. And um, the research that we've done indicates that there are all sorts of different levels of qualification you can get. You can take a, a workshop down at uh, HAP in Springfield and come out of it with a certification as a you know, first time uh, rental property owner uh, with your freshly minted manual for 35 bucks, and that's a level of qualification. You can get certification by taking some courses and workshops from professional organizations that do this. You can do college coursework and get certification and or degrees of different, at different levels in property management under, you know, for instance, the School of Management at, at UMass, you could do that. Uh, but there are some colleges that specialize in it. So there, there are all sorts of different levels, and there's also came up through the ranks and have been doing it for 30 years and, and that sort of thing. Um, so there are choices out there to, to be able to apply different levels and intensities of qualification to different circumstances as they seem appropriate. So in some ways, this is the issue, because I'm not sure taking a course is going to make someone a better property manager. So in other words, in some ways, the gut instinct as to whether or not somebody's capable. In other words, it's, it's, I can think of a lot of unqualified people that would meet this other definition of qualification that, that then actually, that, that's kind of the loophole that I'm worried about, I guess, is that um, you know, we ask for a certified property manager of which there are some certifications, but it doesn't solve the basic problem of somebody who passes the smell test. Well, let me just ask, um, if I might, is the term resident manager defined in terms of qualification or will soon be after? It's not, it's not defined in terms of qualification because the intent was to allow permit granting bodies to respond you don't want, we didn't want to back that into a corner and say you have to have this qualification or that qualification. It was a judgment then, call. Then I think we should just leave it as resident manager and then at some future time if that gets defined or if there's a qualification requirement coming out of one of these other initiatives that we go with that. Because we're not going to be deciding it. We're not going to be deciding what the qualification level is or how to enforce it. That's going to happen at this point somewhere else, either through self, safe and healthy neighborhoods or the zoning board. So um, I don't really mind the term qualified as much as the ongoing presence, but, um, or ongoing is, I guess, the word that I'm hung up on. I, I could go either way, but I could also just. Um, if, if you decide to take out all of the um, amendments to section six, this, this mm -hmm. changes to simply the removal of. 13, and I would repeat that one of the, the distinctions between 13 and 6, as it stands, is the repeated emphasis that there's a quali some kind of qualification there. Whether we're defining it or not, mm -hmm. the notion of the communities, I think, the community's notion is that it wants these people to be able to be qualified to do this. How we then decide how, what that mm -hmm. means is another okay. question. Then, mm -hmm. All right, then I, I would um, consider a motion, making a motion, which I'm not making it, to strike the ongoing presence of and leave qualified in as a acknowledgement of that concern because we're striking 13. So, uh, people feel like that's right for a motion. <laughs> oh, I move that. Okay, so it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion further? 
All in favor of that recommendation to the planning board? Opposed? I would leave it as it is. Okay. I'm comfortable with it. And I okay. think that's what people in the neighborhoods are asking for. So. Okay. Yeah. The ongoing presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they do three to one? Three to one. They do use that word mm -hmm. in this. So let's move on to our other main. And yes. Was that a recommendation to Recommend the planning board the planning that board this board. be accepted with that change? Yes. Planning board may decide mm -hmm. not to accept our recommendation. Um, so we we last time we we looked at um, <coughs> mixed use centered district uh, dimensional table and also standards and conditions for mixed use buildings. Um, we also have um, form-based design regulations waiting in the wings. Um, and I, um, I guess I would say that my, uh, I just want to reiterate my intent, my, th my hope is that both of these will, will be coming forward at the same time. In other words, they're, they, they're sort of two parts to the whole. So I don't, I don't want to... Um, when you say both, if I may, are you referring to the two am amendments having to do with mixed-use centers, or are you talking about those and the, the form-based design yes, regulations, yes, the yes, latter? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, the two and the one are both. Um, so, so I don't want to run out of time um, and not have one, because I think it might be difficult to, to pass this um, relaxation of, of dimensions and, and uses if we don't also if we aren't also offering something else so um, let's keep that in mind um, uh, that said um, are people ready to look at form-based design regulations or do we want to um, um, review these the, the changes that that were made to the other articles first Review the other first, but hopefully get to that. I'm ready to talk about form base tonight. Okay. Some markups if we get can get to that. Get that done. Okay. Let's then let's let's quickly look at uh, the other two. Um, if you want to look at the uh, dimensional amendments, we okay. made, made all of the changes that you requested and added uh, uh, an amendment to section 6.19 to the maximum height section. Mm -hmm. removed that over and made adjustments to it. I, I would just note that, um, as I think was said last time, on the first page, you really have <coughs> sort of this is a smorgasbord. You can, you can choose to go forward with just the, the proposed changes to the limited business and commercial districts and leave the other two districts alone because they're already in better shape than, than those two districts. You could go with you know, the first two, including changes to the BVC, which are actually fairly substantial and bring it closer to general business. And then the general business amendments themselves are actually fairly minor because it's already quite a dense district in terms of its uh, dimensional requirements. So the, those changes are actually less than they might otherwise seem. They're not, they're not substantial uh, compared to the others. The biggest changes, I think, are to the BVC. Um, and those might actually raise some concerns because some of the similar changes that were part of the form-based regulations raised concerns when the, that came forward before. Okay. So I was, just to remind you, you've got the, you know. <laughs> and likewise. Uh, cafeteria we, style here. Right. <laughs> so likewise, uh, with, we can, uh, there can also be horizontal divisions where we don't necessarily take all of the suggestions. Yeah, I, uh, last, at our last meeting, um, we talked about whether to take all three or not, <coughs> and um, our, you, our chair said they could be divided on the floor. And I might suggest, and we may not want to get into sort of strategy yet, we're just looking at the content, but laying this out or setting this up so it was clearly A for BL Con, B was the vote for BVC, and C the vote for BG, and maybe at some point they can see it horizontally if it's easier, easier to compare, but that we um, discuss it in three components, and then if somebody does want to divide, and that way we're not hanging one piece up over another, um, or having someone trying to figure out how to 
how to divide it up, which can get pretty messy on the floor, something like this. It would change the lettering of the other sections, but um, you know, if it's clear sailing, we can do all three, but I just, I, I agree that the BL comm is our most, we feel is our highest priority, and I just, there's a way to have people talk about the specifics for each one separately instead of okay. um, conspiracy to take over the dimensional right, Bruce. chart. I was wondering if it's possible to have a few examples showing the changes because I think it's hard to get a grasp of it just seeing figures. I know it's hard to do an example because the lot sizes vary and so forth, but you mean a drawing or something? Or what some kind of a drawing, yeah. yeah. Or even if, even if a description of yeah. under the current, if you have an X size lot, you could build this, and under the proposed, you could build this. E even something like that. It just, to me, would seem like people could grasp it more easily that way. A drawing would be even better, but if even a description, I think, would be helpful. Um, I think that's a, a good idea, and I also wonder about um, how this might in some ways conflict with form-based uh, regulations because I think in some instances institutional buildings and m municipal buildings, civic buildings, um, often do have you know quite a large setback like St. Bridget's Church or the Jones Library and possibly the... Um, Grange Hall down here, the, I forget what it's called exactly, the but, side, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so those have kind of, kind of a big lawn area in front of them, generally speaking, so I wonder, um, you know, if, if you were to illustrate various examples, that would be one of them that might not fit into this, you know, 20 foot maximum setback, so that brought to mind the possibility that maybe those kinds of buildings could be exempt from this, um, maximum front setback. Anyway, just offering that for something to think about. Well, I, I think that raises a question, though, of if there would be a new institutional building proposed in one of these areas, do we want it to be set back that way so far from the street? Because there is a disadvantage to that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, my inclination would be the closer to the street, the better, really. I think that's a really good point, but what if it's out what if it's sort of a, a gap tooth kind of thing like you have three existing you have two in one existing large structures that are back and the lot you're filling in or rebuilding on is is forced to be in a different cadence on the street edge. So is there a way to give some consideration for reflecting the existing street pattern um when this uh maximum setback might not make sense. It's just following up on your point. I, I think the danger to that, though, is that you could end up still being stuck with the 1960s suburban layout in a town center, which we're all trying to change because it doesn't work very well. Because uh, I remember the consultants talking about that in North Amherst with the grocery store there that's set way, way back, and that mm -hmm. it would be more helpful to have a building closer to the street, mm -hmm. to the sidewalk. I think if you were going to introduce a, a change, there are two ways to come at it. You can, right now under BBC, the, the front setback um, is amenable to a special change modification through a special permit period for the entire category. So a church that really, for instance, that really wants to have a campus feel and a large green sward so that it has a transitional space from the profane to the sacred or however they want to look at it, uh, has the opportunity to say this is the way we design these spaces so uh, we'd like you to, to alter that that maximum um, that can happen now under the language there's a superscript a there already right. yeah. um, the the other way is to explicitly i think as as chris mentioned to explicitly uh, allow for modification for those kinds of uses i think the challenge there is that I'm not sure we'd be able to envision all of the, the uses that might want to do that. Uh, we could certainly predict the ones that would normally want to do that, but there may be other circumstances of which we can't imagine, which is why the, the general, the superscript A is there. They can use it, but but it's putnote not, A. 
PVC changes and BG changes are super are um, superscript C, not A. But A uh, attends to the entire category. If you look over on the left at the title, oh, there's an A there. Okay. So A's elsewhere okay. are really redundant. Where is it? Oh, here. So this footnote applies to all of this. So it's A plus C. Other questions about the other um, changes here? Yeah, actually, I, I, this doesn't actually reflect what I thought we talked about last time. I, I thought we had asked for uh, a minimum, maximum front setback in BLCOM as well, 0 to 20 there as well. We didn't? Oh, okay. What? Well, then I'm mis mistaken. Check the minutes. No, I'm just. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and and the other one that that surprised me was the maximum height, 45, um, which I I I thought I don't remember changing that. We had gone to uh, three and a half floors. Right. And in order to accommodate that, um, it's in ten ten feet of floor. Uh, above the first floor, and the first floor is anywhere from 12 to 15, depending on the use. So this, this allows for that. The other change that we did make was um, uh, under C, and this affects this, uh, we made uh, an adjustment of the kind that, st that Stephen had suggested, we found language mm -hmm. that adjusted where the highest point was based on the different kinds of roof structures there were. Um, the highest point of the roof for flat roofs, deck line for mansard roofs, and the average height between eaves and ridge for gable, hip, and, and gambrel roofs. Uh, so that that adjustment is there. Um, okay. So I have a weird question. Go ahead. And I appreciate very much that change, but we don't um, <laughs> we don't have a definition of minimum height, so. I'm sorry. Don't we don't have a definition of minimum height, so do we need one? Because, as you mentioned, um, let's say that I have an A-frame that goes up to 32 feet, starts at the ground sloping, so the average height is 16. Does that? We have that in BVC. We do have it. It's proposed yeah. in BVC that the minimum height is 16 feet. For single-family structures, one one of the uh, lines of thought that has been wandering around for several years is that maybe we ought to be requiring more than one story. If someone puts a new building in, you can't put a single-story building in there. And that Con Connie's uh, qu quizzical frown is the response that we that everyone has been making. Why would we want to do that? There might be some instances. Uh, a movie theater, small movie theater, or something, where you would want to have a single-story building, uh, and you shouldn't. But uh, really, I guess really, my question is: so minimum. So I, I actually support minimum height, but should we be using that same pitch roof? In, in other words, I actually I think that this is a case where we'd want it to be like the old definition. Um, ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Well, right, right now it's all maximum height. Yeah, yeah. So the, those adjustments. So in the case of the a minimum height, though, I'm not sure we want to have that allowance for peaked roofs, or in other words, then you could do a cape. That um, I think we want to have a different different definition for minimum height. So we want the minimum height to be the roof. Well, from the ground to the eave, yeah. at least, or to the parapet if it's a flat-roofed building. Okay, and that's, so you're saying in the case of a, of a building in, in the BVC zone, you don't want to have, accidentally have something that is too small because you're measuring the middle, the, the middle. You're point, measuring the, the average, average roof height or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Even though the, the, the peak might be way up there. The the the, height, the average height might be 15 feet instead of 16. Yeah. You're saying so. You can have a cape, for example, where the average height is 16 feet, but that's not the intent. I think the in intent is to create a street wall that's at least 16 feet. Okay. And I don't think that a 
I think I it works for maximum, but I don't think it works for minimum. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, I think I get it. Well, if, if I may, the, I'm sure I do get it, the definite, there is no section in the by, as you were pointing out, there is no section in the bylaw that addresses minimum height. So Just all of the where you measure sense. from stuff doesn't occur unless we provide it, which we should, to uh, uh, footnote N would be the place to put it okay. if we're going to have it. Or we'll leave it to common sense. Mm. But are you worried about people sort of gaming, <laughs> gaming the system yeah. and bringing a roof line way down near the ground in order, because for some reason they want a higher peak than the height limit allows, and so you get something like an A-frame. Well, Bing, Kentucky Fried Bank, you know, wants to, you know, they don't meet the minimum height requirements, so they do something goofy to, using our own so, definition to. Do I understand that what you're arguing is to take the minimum out? Entirely? No, I'm not arguing. No. Well, I like the minimum. No. You want to add no. a you want to add a definition that a lot that keeps the goofiness from occurring. Mm. Yeah. In the averaging okay. that you can't go below a certain <laughs> height for the minimum. Uh, the, if I could explain my my quizzical look about regulating it to you know that possibility of regulating it to no single fam no f one story, I I made that face because I'm thinking of. These really good intentions, like limiting um, mixed-use buildings to no residential space on the first floor, because wanting to encourage a certain use or a certain look, and we sometimes do ourselves in when we try to create these dimensional regulations because we want to have a certain thing happen, and we get very um, limiting. So it was just thinking of it we have good ideas that we want you know how we think it's going to look and zoning's kind of a blunt tool and we're using kind of like a you know so that's why I wouldn't want something that's said you you can't have any single story buildings because but, it may and, not make I mean not that you I know we don't and the fact that the 16 is meant to say that if you if you have a single family that the purpose of it is to address single family or single, single family, story. single story right, right. structures. Right. So but since you called me out on my quizzical look and our, okay, our, our <laughs> we're not on camera, I wanted to just explain what I was thinking about. We get, we, we try to have outcomes, but. Yes, we have to be careful of unintended consequences. So, um, Stephen, would, um, if I may, would the same set of rules um, as have been added to 16.19 or 6.19 in terms of measuring um, to a point, the highest point on a roof of, of the various kinds, would those work if you're applying it to a minimum height? No, see, that's what I'm worried about, that I don't think that they would work because I yeah. think in the terms of a maximum height that a, like a good street wall would have some flat roofs, but then possibly some peaked roofs that, you know, the, the average height creates the, that street wall. I don't, some, for whatever reason, I don't think that works as a minimum. So the minimum, I would say, would be either to the parapet or to the, 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 the eave. So um, the form-based design regulations do sort of address that, I think. So 14.1024, ground story heights. Gr the ground, I mean, maybe I don't understand what a ground story is, but, but the ground story, <clears throat> we're talking at least 12 feet high for commercial mixed use. 14 point what? 14.1024. Mm. Um, the top, yeah. And the ground, a ground story of a residential building, ten feet tall at least. Um, so, so that's suggesting a a, a certain um, street wall. Fourteen point ten twenty four. It's on the it. like those. It's like the third or fourth page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Third page. That's different than what is in the, that's interesting because that language is not changed and yet it differs from what the dimensional 
table was showing. Somebody didn't cross-reference things. And yeah, and, and so so the and and uh, likewise in ten fourteen point ten twenty three it talks about uh, flat roofs. Are, shall we not be permitted for one story buildings unless the front elevation is at least fifteen feet in height? Flat roofs are permitted only for civic, commercial, and mixed use buildings with the maximum number of floors. And I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, where's that? This is the, 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 the previous the paragraph section. ahead of twenty three. And twenty three. Uh, you might have just been having So, so this is this is. That's similar, yeah. That's a similar issue. <clears throat> I'm, I'm wondering if we're overthink, yeah. overthinking the minimum because it does say in the new proposed 6.19 that we're looking at, um, the special permit granting authority shall consider the patterns of height and roof sty styles established by existing building structures. So to do something that's gaming the system, I think, wouldn't happen because it would be really out of keeping with the pattern, like the A-frame example. Yeah, the, the only thing would be if, if it's, this is aspirational, that we're hoping for change, you know, from a suburban to a less suburban. But I think maybe we're overthinking this, and I, th I would be happy just leaving it the way it is. Um, okay. I'm, so, are, are people comfortable with 45 feet as a maximum height? I'm I'm not um, entirely convinced by the by the explanation here. Um, in particular, because we're going to be calling attention to section 6.19, which says that I can can go up by another 10 feet potentially with a special permit. So, so you want to keep the minimum the same, 40, and then in both cases, or the maximum, yeah. 40. So it's potentially but 40 plus I'm 10. I'm still confused. Do you, want to right. keep, do you want to keep the minimum maximum in BVC, or do you want to? Um, I, 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 like, I like minimums as well, and I would, I would put minimum in BLCOM. Yeah. Hmm. So I would, I would make it. So it's 40 in both cases still, or, or proposed as 40 in both cases, but you're adding a 16, or what should we say? Uh, it said 12 to 18, 16 sort of split the difference. Um, well, it's, it's the ground story is 12 feet tall. So 12 um, rather and than there's, 16. And there could be a roof that, that yes, allows you to get up to 16, so yes. I, I, don't, I don't think it's needs to be any different than that um just just to be clear so we're instead of we would it's 35 now in bl com and we're proposing to go to 40 with the possibility of um the special permit granting authority allowing up to another 10 feet if right. an argument is made and it's currently 40 in bvc and we would be leaving that the same or are proposing another five feet. I, I think it's going to be. I, I think even forty is going to be difficult to pass. So I'm concerned. I, I would like to pass something. So I don't want to propose something that's going to fail. Um, so so um, so even if I think that forty five is the right number. You know, if I want to at least have forty, uh, you know, I, I. I'm agreeing with you. I just want to. Thir be clear. Thirty five goes to. 40 proposed in the first column, the first grouping, and then 40 stays at 40 for the maximum in the next, right. in the BBC, and we're not. But we're adding a minimum. And BG, we haven't talked about that yet. Right. Right. Okay. And so, and I also, I also want to come back to the minimum front setback. People are saying that we did not have, we did not suggest that last time is there a reason why why that's we don't think that's a good idea in bl or com minimum uh zero i'm sorry rob you're you're questioning having 60 feet that's a minimum no mi the minimum front setback um we have a range or we're proposing a range in bbc and possibly a range in, in bg why not in bl com 
like cuz. Yeah. Cuz. This is a different zoning district. <laughs> well, um, hmm. <clears throat> if you look at the form based regulations and you look at the non conforming section, which is way at the back, it has a number of illustrations talking about the the street yard mm -hmm. s setback, um, which is not necessarily the uh, front setback. Well, maybe it is. It is. And buildings are being proposed into it up to up to that. Not up to the property line, but within a. Well, I'm not sure what that is. Question now, uh, the question in my mind is, do you, in BLCOM, do you want to go to zero? Or do you want to have a, a minimum, minimum 10 and 20 or something? So, so um, this is exactly why I think it's, it's useful. Um, if you don't have a maximum, then there's no, there's no way to figure out where the, the street yard setback is. So, I'm not, it doesn't have to be zero, but it could be 10 to 20, or, or it could be 5 to 20, or 5 to 25, or something like that. Um, but if we want if we want new buildings to come up closer to the street, then we have to we have to say it can't be any farther back than this, whatever it is. Um, but if we think that the BL and the Com district should have deep setbacks potentially deep setbacks, you know, that, that's why we wouldn't put a, a, a maximum on them. I, I disagree with that, but, but, you know, maybe that's, maybe I'm wrong. There, there does seem to be some logic to using the same kind of thinking through the three categories. I, I, I objected to the five foot because I thought, if you're going to have five feet, either have it be zero or have it be, mm -hmm. I mean, it just seemed to micro. Mm -hmm. um, but we could, you know. Maximum 30, drive. just to be yeah, consistent. To, yeah, to give it more flexibility. One ten, of ten, ten. Yeah, 10 um, minimum, 30 maximum, if I'm following your thinking. Well, the existing setback's 20, so mm -hmm. the presumption is that somewhere out there we have two or three buildings that <laughs> <laughs> conform to the 20-foot setback. Um, were built during the time of zoning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always a little leery about having, a, except in a, a really a, a center center, having a zero uh, <coughs> setback because you end up with people having to petition the select board to use parts of the public way to do outdoor dining and things like that because nobody thought to, you know, they, they built a commercial building first that didn't have restaurants in it and then restaurants come to occupy the space and there's no place to do street yard activity. So that's why, my temp except in the BG, my temptation is to, to leave a five foot or, or something set back just so that there's room to have additional activities, whether it's display of out, outdoor display of goods or whatever. It's just eddy space. Um. I don't mind having it in the zero, um, having that concern in the, in the BG, but I don't think we have a lot of those kind of, I, I, without an analysis of what we have and where this could happen, it, 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 I feel like we're just kind of we have Throwing some numbers around. precious little of it. Uh, I'm thinking of North Amherst, for instance. You have the old mm -hmm. post office building, which is a, a Japanese restaurant, and that was built right up on the sidewalk. It's the only building in North Amherst that I'm aware is, except for some residences, um, as a commercial building. Everything else has a suburban, the suburban setback that Bruce was referring to. The downtown. Uh, is the only place I can think of in any of our centers that has buildings right up on the on the public way, right up on the edge of the sidewalk. Um, everything else is different levels of, of distant back. 
I think we might want to think about the width of sidewalks, too. In the downtown area, the sidewalks tend to be fairly generous. They're like 10, 12 feet or even more. So having a building right on the edge of the sidewalk or right on the property line may be fine because there's a lot of room to move back and forth. Whereas, you know, out in the village centers, maybe up in North Amherst, I'm not sure that there's a pattern set yet for how wide the sidewalk is. And often it's probably going to be five feet. So do we want you know, the road and then the five-foot sidewalk and then the building right next to it, I guess we should think about, you know, how that would feel. So what about um, changing the BVC standard to be the same as the BL COM standard instead of, right now it's the same as the BG. I'm just talking about front setback. We have the zero to 20. What about doing the 10 to 30 for BVC so that you have if, the, if that's meets your concern with wanting some extra space and maybe that's more in keeping with those centers I, and just our own internal consistency across these. Do you have a feeling? No. Oh, I like that proposal. Okay, so um, I guess I'm okay with that. Ten to ten to thirty, ten to thirty in those two mm -hmm. categories. Mm -hmm. I think it also it shows that the patterns that we're looking for in BVC are less intensive than the pattern that we're looking for for the downtown or for the BG, and I think that that's true. Ten years from now, when we have huge growth and development and a pattern established in the BBC, we might find out that we want to change the bar one way or the other. Okay. Um. Um, I, unless there are other things about the the table, I think that actually I do have I do have a question yeah. about the okay. table. I just I just uh, want to clarify. So basic minimum lot area and additional lot area per family. For those, for business owners, that really only applies to um, converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings. That's right. So, so is there is there a demand for changing that? If we don't have to change it. Do we do we want to offer something people to? Uh, right now, there is no. Um, that's B, right? Yeah, it's, it's in which be. zone is that that we're talking about? That should be in the, uh, the BL com. That should uh, under BL com. There should be a superscript or B there with the twenty five hundred. No, I, I'm saying I'm saying there isn't now. I'm saying we're we're suggesting that you can have a, sm a smaller lot for a converted dwelling. That that's that's what that is saying. You're right. That's, that's all it's saying. You're right. That's all it's saying. And so BL com or, or no, BBC. for BL com and BBC both. Because the only residents of the lot are converted dwellings, right? Um, and so, if if there's no demand for 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 a smaller lot, you know, it's 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 a suggestion of of increased density. I, I don't have any opposition to it, but but somebody might. And so, if we don't need it, why sh why suggest it? Or mixed use, right? Isn't that the other? It's the calculation of how many units you could get in a mixed use uh, building. I thought that was the No. No, it is uh what if there's a superscript B, what it does is take away the requirement for basic minimum lot area, additional lot area for family, and basic minimum lot frontage requirements. Those only apply to subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings. Okay. And that's what be should be whether we change the number or not, should be the the footnote B should be added to the BL COM adjustment. My question was, based on what Rob is saying, whether or not we even need to make, change the number for the additional lot area per family in the BVC district. The only thought I have there is you, subdividable dwellings are usually, the presumption is that they would be new buildings. We haven't ever actually built any. Oh, new buildings, okay. Um, converted dwellings are adjustments to existing buildings which tend to be on smaller lots than uh, meet the, you know, the requirements anyway. So um, and we, had, we haven't done an analysis of, of those to, to tell. So we, we might not need to change the additional lot area per family in the BVC, but just change the, 
basic minimum lot area. Okay. Does that make sense? Are those things we have to change? Chris? Um, well, there is a change to footnote B itself, adding BL and COM right. to footnote B. Ah, sure. So if you, if someone or if town meeting didn't go along with that change, but they went along with the changes in A, you might then need that um, dispensation from the larger lot area. You know what I'm saying? Is, is town meeting, uh, is there a possibility the town meeting would divide this um, well, I think this proposal into three parts and take some of it and not other parts of it? They, they would probably, what, what we would offer, as, as described already, is the changes, all of the changes to BL Calm under one, all of the changes to BVC under another, and all of the changes to BG under a third, and, but, uh, you know, to hunt and peck and choose among the changes within any of those, I think the moderator would have a hard time dividing that out. Someone can always move to amend. Well, I, I understand division. that for Section A, that you would take all of these separately. But then um, would you also now we're talking, take... If, if I may, we're, we're talking about re reorienting the way we are dividing this up and have what is now A be A for this, B for this, and C for that. I see. So A would include this yeah, change, would add right. B, L, and COM to this, but no B. Um, a would include that. A would include would include a new footnote B added to that, and and it would include that would change to footnote B. The amendment to the foot, yeah, that's a good question. We we should probably do that as part of it. Yes. To what? After we got done last time, the only amendment to a footnote, the only footnote being amended was B. We should add that to. Um, first amendment that you were creating <laughs> to change table okay. three and under the BL and COM mm -hmm. dimensions. Add for note B to, uh, to the discussion add of, that to as of a, a. That first so a. this is A, and it only works if you adjust this footnote. So it should show up in the first section of the proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It can be done. Little, little gymnastics here and there. <coughs> um, okay. Does that all make sense? I, I think I've heard everything. Uh, I've got all that, and we'll, we'll put the elves will go to work. Um, uh, s the last page. Are there any questions about the proposed amendments to maximum height? Um, is it our? Are uh, the terms Mansard, um, Rick Gable, Hip, and Cambrel um, well defined or well understood? I mean, I have a, I have a sense of what they are, but I don't. I'm not sure that that there is. McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, we've got we can provide pictures out of the library, architectural forms. So, so the difference between Mansard and Gambrel is is clear. Can provide a pictures yeah. showing the it. Camera is pitched all the way up. Flat. Oh, it's flat on top. Yeah, yeah. Camera kind of like a Dutch colonial yeah. is is a mansard. If oh, it's that's got a gambrel. That's a gambrel. Okay, that's right, a, a gambrel. A, man, a mansard, mansard is a flat. A, your McDonald's is a gambrel. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, a mansard. So it goes mm -hmm. wall uh -huh. pitch flat. Okay. Okay. So the jo Jones Library is a Cambrel, right? I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlie Horse. So yeah, I, I think that I think that looks good. Um, so we. Okay. <sighs> Moving right oh. along. Um, Mixed-use buildings, standards and conditions. I think this is, uh, we've made the changes from last time. Um, 
We took out the GFA, mm -hmm. the total GFA, the 6,000 square feet, as a uh, criteria period. Now there are only two thresholds, a total GFA greater than twice the area devoted to commercial uses, or uh, 12 dwelling units. That's the threshold where you go from site plan review to special permit for a mixed use building. Um, in the last paragraph, uh, we've divided it up. Uh, and the way in which we talked about having it uh, directing the, the dwelling units to the rear is to prohibit them facing the street and then refer to it later as first floor residential dwelling units and any required entries thereto shall be located on the rear, sort of a double reinforcement. Um, and then finally, the last sentence, we went to 15% associated with upper floor uses as uh, had been tested by Mr. Uh, Kuhn. Comments or questions about that? I'm that, that last phrase, any residential uses in upper floors, I'm, I'm not getting how that relates to the stair and elevator towers or other purposes. That's because it's the relation starts earlier in the sentence. No more than 15% of the gross floor area on the first floor shall be associated with or incidental to, whether for storage, required entries, stair floor, elevator towers, or other purposes, any residential uses on upper floors. Could rearrange the sentence to make yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say it's phrased a little awkwardly, I think. Whether for. So I, I have a question about that phrasing in the first. Um, <coughs> Any associated internal space associated with dwelling units shall occupy any first floor portion of buildings facing onto a street. Um, so how would that be applied to Bowood Place? Does Bowood Place face onto a street? And if so, does that mean that could have all been residential? That's, that's not what my intent would have been. Excuse me, this would only apply in the commercial district, this last paragraph, so Bowood Place hmm. is in a BG? So it wouldn't apply yeah, to that principles. one? But the principle, yeah. Example is a good one. I'd say onto a public way or a... a public way, yeah. yeah. Street's a particular definition, right? Or um, I mean, you can, you can craft all sorts of language, you know, a way customarily used by the public or, you know. Um, in this case, it meant public ways, uh, including on corners. And what you Could were saying that. was that with relationship to where hmm. people are entering the building on the, where the face of the building is, uh, that's where commercial activity is and residential uses are not. Right, I think public way would be, a, or, or something, because street means street. the same thing. Mm -hmm. You think? Yeah. Okay, but that's that's a, a single lot, along with Judy, so, so I guess, um, so any street, I guess. Um, a street is defined in the, in Article 12, <clears throat> an accepted public way or way which the town clerk certifies is maintained and used as a public way or a way shown on a plan which has been approved. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, in all cases, it's a recognized public or private way. Um, you're right. The, the, the principle would be a problem if this was applying to the general business district, but it, it's not. It's applying to the commercial districts, which are almost exclusively at least as currently configured sort of highway corridors at this point. What we're talking about is adjusting the rules, not only these, but others later on, right. so that we end up with those being centers rather than mixed use centers rather than highway corridors. Right. I, I'm wondering if the um, protection or the uh, kind of caveat we want to add might be that it, uh, the residential um, component on the first floor can't can't exceed a certain you know 50 percent of the ground floor some some way that say if, if it were but would place if it were in hmm. that's that similar situation if you couldn't just do um if it wasn't on a public way and it was on an alley or something um do you still have to have some percentage of retail or commercial on the ground floor regardless of that whether there was a street or a way there um, because here it doesn't really give any ratio. It just, I, I like, I mean, I know we talked about being able to use the back of a, of a deep building 
residential in the rear, but we don't have a limit to how much little skinny, you know, 10 foot. <laughs> and, right. Uh, so maybe it's the, a ratio that we need to add to this as a protection. Well, and also the, in, um, in, the, in the original form-based um, article, there were, stand, in part of the standards and conditions of, of certain uses, it talked about right. shall not be used to a depth of 100 feet from the public right-of-way or something. So maybe that's... That, that purpose was specifically to address Sunderland Road as a uh, corridor, right. which the, the public through the, the design workshops and the rest has identified as an area that they thought should be strictly commercial and the way to protect that from other uses was to prohibit residential uses within a certain distance. I think, I, I, I get what Connie's saying, I think you'd, it would need to get a little more complicated. What if in fact you had an alley that was customarily used by the public for pedestrian passage and I think that would make perfect sense to have some dominant portion of it be entrances for shops or whatever as opposed to somebody's side door. Although you know, the more urban it gets, there's a there's a line there that moves, and I'm not sure what that line is. And I think it's more it's complicated. It depends on what the intended end result is. So, um, so this might be a candidate for eventual, not now, obviously, but at some point, in, uh, we we talked about. Um, developing overlay overlays to, to help define our, our village centers. And so an overlay might say to a depth of 100 feet from Sunderland Road or from whatever or from some other place from College Street it shall not be residential except on upper floors or something. I think, again, uh, we're, we're sort of thinking ahead of ourselves yeah. here, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. But bear, we need to come back to the fact that we're, what we're doing is we're changing the rules in the limited business in the commercial districts, which right now are these highway corridors. And we'll, if you think about the first 10 years of development in those areas, during which we'll have 20 opportunities to change the zoning, uh, you, I think having the residential uses pretty much strictly on the back of the building, at the rear of the building, if they're on the ground floor, makes sense. Uh, I think the question, though, that's been raised here that, that could be added to this is whether or not you want to have a minimum percentage of the ground floor, and this is the tricky part, be commercial as opposed to residential. Remember, we were trying to do it the other way around when we did the first um, uh, amendment to this. We were saying no more than what was it, 30% or 40% of the first floor was going to be dedicated to residential uses, which meant that the rest of it was going to be commercial. Um, you can do it either way. Um, anyone have any suggestions? You can do it as an absolute requirement, or you can say if you want to exceed a certain percentage of residential on the first floor, you have to go for a special permit. I mean, there's both options are in here as, as it's constructed. Okay, so this is something that we're going to have to keep working on. And this is not this part is not ready. Um, so let's let's put that in the back of our heads and keep thinking about it. Um, shall we move to form-based design? Um, General comments? Um, I, I, I guess I, I'll start off with a question. Um, this, this packet, I, I, is this intended to be uh, uh, the, the complete no. thing? OK, so because you left off the last three sections of the original form-based article. Right. And, and wondering if that was were, intentional. Well, there are several. Uh, there's several pieces that are sort of um, housekeeping pieces that aren't in here. Um, 
some of which got removed because we changed the approach. Because you're applying the general regulations to the existing zoning districts, you don't have to go out and create new districts, and that doesn't ripple through the bylaw. Uh, not included in here also and not mentioned are the definitions, all of the definitions that accompany these, and that would have to be added. Um, but the principal question was the street types and how to deal with design of streets, how to deal with the regulation of streetscapes and uh, on private property. And um, I included a recommendation here that you, and I thought there was a consensus that the previous illustrations just nobody was really comfortable with them. They weren't clear enough. They, um, it was hard to read them and so forth. Um, you might want to consider, or the board, a full board might want to use some of its funds, um, its master plan funds, to hire somebody to do new illustrations. But I also included for your uh, light weekend reading here, uh, an excerpt from the urban form analysis, which was a study that was done as part of the master planning process. Um, and I've just included an excerpt that is the model um, infill zoning district that was a form-based district and it includes building types and, and language and so forth. The last two pages, last four pages really, uh, all sides of the pages, are streetscape designs of a different type. And um, I don't know whether they're clearer, whether they address the need or whether you would want something yet different uh, to illustrate the um, form-based design regulations. I do like these pictures better. My suggestion, though, would be um, that I, I, I think that the street type is probably not necessary for the zoning bylaw. And I think that it might be a good idea to give that section and the urban form analysis to the transportation um, master plan task force. And say, I'm, not, I'm not talking, if I may, I'm not talking about the street. Well, one of the one of the challenges for what it was proposed before was that it attempted to show the street or recommend a treatment for the street. Mm -hmm. What we're really talking about is what happens to the private property, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to sort of show the street in the process of doing that. But what happens when you hit, go past the line to the building? What happens in that street yard area? Right. And, so yeah, so some of that stuff could could stay in in the bylaw, I think, but but I don't think that all I don't think the the um, um, d sketches, I don't think the the table street types needs to be in the bylaw. I think um, section fourteen point twenty one is okay, and twenty two. Um, but but I don't I don't think the other ones are necessary. And I think they they could help um, inform um, a, a transportation master plan because they do they do they do describe streets um, in ways that that are interesting and and would be helpful in the long term I think for a transportation designer um, and. Presumably, if the transportation master plan ever gets um, going and, and, and gets finalized and something is produced and accepted, it will be, become part of the master plan. So it, is, it, is a, it would be part of the planning documents of the town without having to be in the zoning bylaw. So you, well, you're, if I understand you correctly, aside from the transportation, stuff what you're saying is that you don't think there needs to be there need to be street types in this what there need instead to be and what's not quite in here although there may be some elements of it is our set of regulations governing what happens between the front of the property and the and the building really the street yard treatment I agree, and I, I would also suggest that the building and site types could be an ancillary document. Um, whether it has to be redone or not redone, it, it wasn't so much, but as a supporting uh, set of information or guidelines, but not embedded in the article or in this part of the zoning. Yeah, I, I would agree with that also because I think 
I'm worried about this being so long and complicated that if we could simplify it, I think that would be much better. And some of these maybe could fall on in the future if they're needed at that time. So I, one concern I would have is when you talk about the street types, that's making people think that has to come first and then possible redevelopment when I think we have to proceed with the redevelopment whether the street type changes or not because that could be years and years away. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a little misleading. Um, so, so what do you think about the building types? What was it? I, your I would agree with Connie. I think that could be informational, but I don't think it has to be part of the bylaw that we're presenting. Mm -hmm. um, I I disagree with that. I I do think the building types are an important part of of the form based regulations. Um. I I agree, but I think it can be referenced, and like we have our bylaw talks about. Um, other standards and, and guidelines and requirements, but we don't actually physically have them in the zoning bylaw, but they, they can still be, have, have uh, the, the same power of, of regulation. A, a document that's referenced in the same way that the, the Town of Amherst landscape guidelines are, are referenced. Okay, and so are you saying are you saying just the the pictures or the whole section that that's labeled building and site types? Because part of, actually part of the uh, way in which and the place where I think starting I should have enumerated these, starting with uh, fourteen point two zero zero. Um, talking about building design and then 14.21 starts to talk about yards and setbacks and uses and so forth and um, frontage zones and how those get treated so you can take the illustrations of building types uh, you could both the table and the illustrations and set them in a separate document and that might later on be expanded to include streetscape uh, street types and streetscapes if that was something you decided to do but the text I think uh, is valuable uh, would the same be true for the public and private open space types um, I, and bearing in mind and I guess I'll push back a little here to see whether this makes sense to you part of Having it a separate document just adds a layer of got to go get it rather than having it in front of you. And pictures often tell the story better than the words do. Um, uh, so I guess the question is whether or not similarly here you would want to take the table and the illustrations, put that in the separate document uh, and reference it and then just keep the text. Um, and then fi the final piece that's included in this, the non-conforming lots, uses, and structures, how you deal with change to existing buildings that be are made non-conforming in some cases uh, by the new regulations, those have illustrations right in the text. And, and I, I would argue that those illustrations are useful to keep in the text. Similarly, if we're going to talk at all about um, North Amherst and Atkins at any point, the, um, the renderings there for the additional development standards for those two things are important. Is this addition of the 14.5 uh, nonconforming, was this in the earlier version or is this, okay, yes. so I, I would agree that these general illustrations, the diagrams with massing probably work it's this larger section with the photos and I wasn't sure Mr. Tucker if you were saying that the the diagram part mm -hmm. should be lifted out and put with the text that we keep in no and, or I, I got confused. only only on the under the non-conforming section okay. was I talking yeah. about that I, what I, I, I what occurred what occurs to me and I'm thinking as I talk here which is always a dangerous thing to do but um, that the sections on additional development standards for the two village centers for which those were developed, 
the illustrate the tables and illustrations for uh, street types. Maybe the street types comes out entirely because um, we're not ready for it. But the tables and illustrations for building types and for uh, site types, public open space types, in both cases, uh, tables and illustrations go out into the separate document. It has one name. It get, gets referenced in the bylaw. And in the process, um, I have to check with, with town council whether or not you can do this. You're creating advisor, in a way, you are creating advisory recommendations, design recommendations, to which a permit body can refer. They're not definitive. That is to say, if they're not in the bylaw, they're not requirements. They're advisory, in the same way that the landscaping guidelines are. You can't, you can't create zoning in something other than the zoning bylaw. <laughs> So that uh, when you separate it out that way, you, you automatically take some of the teeth away from it. We need to check with town council about exactly what that means, but uh, that's my understanding of it. Um, and so what would be left in here are the, uh, the principal design regulations for the various elements of this. And so if it's all right with you, what I'll do for the next time round, uh, whatever that is to deal with this, I'll pull those pieces apart and have them as two separate things and maybe add in the, the missing pieces uh, for the general regulations and see if that makes more sense. Does that, does everybody understand what? I understand, I, 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 don't, I, just I disagree <laughs> with that approach. But. I just um, wonder if at least some of the black and white drawings um, that illustrate building types might be kept in because they have some definitional uh, value. Um, in other words, when you're reading some of the text, yes. it helps to refer to these drawings because they kind of help to define what is frontage occupancy or what is, you know, what do, what do we mean by a side entry or, you know, just different things that might not be completely obvious to everyone. Um, at the very least, I. I agree with that. I would keep the pictures in too because I think they, they help illustrate. I would be fine with keeping the diagrams in and I just think, and I think the pictures are helpful but I, I think they're just as helpful as a guidance document because they, they're really not, we're not regulating to those pictures. Building burns down, pictures still in the bylaw. I can't put that, all these old pictures in here. I mean it just, there's an updating issue. The diagrams are all generic, they're not so referential. So I, I think it's very helpful to a proponent, a permit applicant, a developer, an architect to have that guidance document. But I, but I don't think we're, so it's helpful, but I don't think we're regulating to those, so. Okay, so so the reason that, that I think that they are, they are integral to the, to the zoning bylaw is because I, I think the, um, the building and site types chart, the table is, should be part of the zoning bylaw. And so they, that describes a civic building and, and this is where, or this is what the intent of a civic building is and this is where a civic building should be and where it should not be. And so rather than have, you know, the, the uh, designations that are there now, NAFB, ACFB, and so on. The chart would have RBC, BBC, BN, BL, BG, and COM. And, and it, would be, it would help you understand where we expect those buildings to be. Because um, right now, those, those are imaginary um, zones, because we didn't actually establish them. We, we wanted to establish them. But we actually have some zones that we're working on that are mixed use zones. And I think it would be useful to say in RVC we have, we have, we have um, mixed use buildings, we have multifamily residential buildings, we have village residential buildings, but we don't have commercial buildings or, or maybe we don't have civic buildings. Um, so I would keep the table in there, and then these these pictures 
help you understand what the what the table is saying, what, what a civic building is, what a commercial building is, and so on. So that's that's why I think it's it's part of form-based design regulations. I understand that people. I, I don't I don't have a hugely strong feeling about this, and I know we'll be discussing it more. But I did have some uh, things in the text I was hoping we could we could get to tonight for consideration that I, that I do have some strong feelings about. So I don't. If we, we can have five or ten minutes for any edits or suggestions that we might have, and it could, I think we've explored the okay. the, uh, the format question sure. quite a bit. Um, so would let's, that let's be, go would through it. Be amenable to that, and yeah. I don't know if we so um, starting at the beginning of 14.00. Now that we're seeing this as a general um, uh, form-based design standard that applies. Uh, to some of the, to all of the uh, mixed use centers, including downtown. There's a couple places, like in the first, it says Amherst Village Centers, and I might say village and town centers, because I think we're being more inclusive, uh, or mixed use centers or something. Uh, so there were just, a f there were a few of those. Uh, uh, um, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Yeah. As we're going through this, if someone has a, another thing on that particular Wait. page before we go on to the next page, just jump in. Go ahead. Uh, yep, stop me. Or, uh, 14.01, um, in streetscape design are integrated with the specific context of a given center instead of based on, because uh, integrated with is, based on is um, seems uh, more heavy handed or more prescriptive that you're start, you start, it has to fit in, but it's not, uh, don't, that's not a big one. Um, 14.02, establishing a pedestrian-oriented development pattern rather than traditional pedestrian, or we don't need the word traditional. We don't really know what that is anyway. 14.05, um, uh, protecting and expanding opportunities for small businesses. A locally owned is a seems like a different agenda than something that goes in the zoning bylaw. We're certainly welcome. Please disagree whenever you're <laughs> wanting to disagree. I think um, bearing in mind that that w what these are are purposes, um, and not they're not prescriptive. They're they're uh, what ideals or goals or something that one of the, and I would admit somewhat tenuous uh, thoughts about outcomes here is that if you adjust the design enough and make it flexible enough, then the opportunity for local businesses to uh, start and succeed and expand uh, in those areas are improved over uh, situations where they're not, where it's inflexible, where it costs more to, to do things and so forth. To, to say that the one follows from the other, I, I agree it's a stretch. <laughs> and that's not something you do with zoning. We're not, uh, you and know how many million times I say you're opening or the doors and the windows, mm -hmm. you're not, you can't and, say who comes through. And I, I can remember way back some hear, permit hearings where um, prior board members voted for or against a permit application because the, the applicant was not local. And I just don't think we want to get into that. I think that we learn in conflict of interest training to not do that, right? That's right. So, just, um, so we just take locally owned owner. out and, mm -hmm. and that covers it. 14.06, um, I would put a period after building in site. So encouraging flexibility and variety in future development while ensuring preservation of historic buildings and sites. Because uh, I think we cover the last part Compatible uh, with new event with existing, we cover that. Um, if I may, that's two different things. One is the actual physical preservation of the structures, and the other is making sure that the new development is not, in terms of its design, um, arguing with doing violence to whatever um, okay, we, existing historic fabric. We, we do have a whole historic section coming up, so we can maybe True. just hold hold that. And just these are just my markups, so we can. Um, 14.07, 
suitable, sustainable design for new and reused buildings, renovated buildings. Yeah, I think sure. it's not just new. Uh, uh, just buildings. Buildings. Uh, good. Um, 14.08, do we want to just say in accordance with the town's master plan because um, this gets very specific and the master plan is going to get amended all the time and yeah. whatever master plan is in effect at the time is referenced by just town of Amherst master plan, period. Uh, after 14.08, the next number should be 14.09, right? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flashback. Uh, <laughs> 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 back a to Dodo. Yeah. Mm, numbering problem. Mm. There's supposed to, that's supposed to be formatted differently. Yeah. It's supposed to come out. Um, to the oh, I'm almost done. So thank you for bearing with me. 14.101, historic preservation and adaptive reuse. Um, this is where probably the part I got <coughs> most hung up on. Um, first of all, maximum extent feasible. I, I'm not sure what that means, practical, feasible, but so it says uh, they should be preserved, rehabilitated, restored, and reconstructed according to the standards for treatment of historic properties of the National Park Service. Um, it's, it, to me, that, that, that seemed like a very rigid, rigid standard to be interjecting here in our general form-based code, it seemed to me to be a backdoor way to, of creating the standard we have in, in local districts, which are voted on and, and, and adopted. It seems like a, um, I, I don't mind like the general historic fabric, try to try to preserve when you can, but I thought this standard was w way beyond that and uh, we're, we're almost creating a historic district overlay in our right. guidelines and I would suggest- We actually got a, that out. Um, a, a, an email about that from Tom Erga right. that made that exact same argument um, very well. It was very convincing. Oh, I well, I thanks because that was probably parroting him and not realizing I had read that, yeah. Um, uh, before, before you make a decision on that, I'd like to provide you with a copy of what all of those standards are. They're not as rigid as they seem. They're in fact designed to be fairly flexible. So <coughs> I agree that what we don't want to do is create a narrow box for things. But uh, let, let me provide you with copies of those. Right, but I'll just, my comment still is: I think that's well beyond the reach of what we're trying mm -hmm. trying to do. Um, Bruce, go ahead. I, I wonder if it could be rephrased in some way to say it's encouraged, rather than mandating it. Um, encouraged means you don't have to do it. Right. No. So, either drop it or, mm. <laughs> sir, yeah. or or require it. I mean, one or the other. And this is, this is applying to, if I may, significant historic building structures, landscapes, and sites. Other sites it doesn't apply to. It's a, where you have an existing resource. Okay. Well, I would ask who decides um, what are significant historic buildings and structures. Right. We have a, um, you know, a pattern in the demolition delay bylaw where the historical commission determines whether something is mm -hmm. significant or not. So. Do we need to add something to this to say as determined by the Historical Commission or? It does say that, yeah. Oh, it does say that? Okay. Last sentence. And we have, we have a lot of historically significant buildings throughout the town, so it's not, yes, it may only apply to historically significant, we have a lot of them. Um, I think I'm getting near the end, but 14.1021, uh, um, 50 feet in length, did we have 100 feet at one point and that, that changed to 50 or was it our? I don't think so. Always fifty. Um, just I don't. I don't think so. But I, I, I can go back. I mean, and I'm just like going from memory. Um, more than fifty feet, you have to articulate. Um, that's fine. And then it says, all at the very end of this section, all building facades visible from public streets shall feature characteristics similar to the front facade. Okay. So, what public. what are we doing? What are we uh, that every Thing that, so there's well, there's three streets and then a back. Um, three sides have to echo each other in terms of features. Or I'm just worried that that may be too too prescriptive. Well, and then the language again. It's a question of the language. I think the intent of this is to prevent sort of false front 
development where you've got a brick box and they, they put you know, articulation and architectural, fe architectural features on the street front facade, but the sides, which you can see from the street front, are this plain brick wall or whatever, stucco, whatever, whatever it is. And uh, the intent is to say, make your architecture consistent, at least in terms of what the public sees. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. It just mm -hmm. has to have well, well, I, characteristics similar. I, yeah, it says feature characteristics. Not I think I think it just may be restricting how how th it, it may be too restrictive, and maybe there's a better way to say it, or along with that general guidance of how things should look. But it, it literally means that anything visible has to be similar to the front facade, and. It, it could be really good looking, but not the same as the front facade. So I like just. Well, features. I'll, I'll defer to uh, talking about this. Uh, I tend to agree. Yeah. <laughs> but the, like Bullwood Place changes as you go around the corner. But mm -hmm. So could you refer to um, proportions and massing and that type of thing? as we do in the design review standards and conditions, rather than a style or a you know, rigid sticking to, this is the way this looks, and so it must continue to look like that. So Jones Library is an example of a building that changes dramatically mm -hmm. as you turn the corner, but it's still beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still. Mm -hmm. It's all visible. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe all you do is you say that there shall be Treated architectural and shall not be, pl you know, plain or yeah, or should should be something your mother would be proud of. Mm. That's right. <laughs> we'll know it when we see it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> okay. Uh. So I'm, I have something on 1023. Um, I, I'm. I'd like to look at 1023, 14.1023. Um, I think the, the section that I quoted earlier, flat roof shall not be permitted, going down to um, commercial mixed use buildings with the maximum number of floors is, is a little confusing to me. Does that mean that flat roofs are only allowed for multifamily residential type buildings at least 15 feet in height? And maybe that's okay. That's. But I just want to. It's not clear to me what it's saying. It's saying flat roofs shall not be permitted for one-story buildings. Flat roofs are permitted only for civic, commercial, and mixed-use buildings with maximum number of floors. So if you have, if it's a one-story building, it can only be a residential, family type at least. Um, no, it can. Um, you could have a civic, commercial, and mixed-use building that doesn't have a flat roof. Right means is you can't have um, a one-story building of any kind with a flat roof unless the front elevation is at least 15 feet in height of any type, building type. Okay, okay, so the second sentence there, for civic commercial and mixed-use buildings, flat roofs are permitted only when, there's, when they've reached the maximum number of floors. Yes, okay. yes, that's a better way to put it. I had a, a note on that. I think we're prohibiting green roofs with this language, and so we may want an exception uh, for that kind of instance. Right. Um, also, I think it's this section is not necessarily consistent with what we what we just described for the height, and I think we need to match it up. I think the four feet and ten feet are in conflict, so I would just suggest go back and match this up with well, I'm not sure they're in, I, I think we do have to make sure they're not in conflict I'm not sure that I they don't are. know but yeah, it's yeah. a question but anyway the green the green roof carve out pretty hard to have the green roof on Hillendale <laughs> I think didn't we discuss the green roof though at one point and, <laughs> I thought we discussed the green roof at one point and it was determined that because we don't have standards for that yet that that Probably but, shouldn't be in here. But somebody could want, want, might want to do right. it. Yeah, we're not, we're not requiring it. What we're saying is someone proposed a building of any of these kinds, and they were proposing a green roof on their own. 
right. which they could do, and we would just have to respond as best we can under the regulations we have. Uh, prohibiting a flat roof for a building with less than the maximum number of floors would uh, prohibit them from doing that, and we're not sure we want to have that effect. So an exception for a green roof in this instance would make sense. I don't think a green roof is a disqualifier. I mean, in other words, I don't think a green roof gives you a pass on contributing to the urbanism. So in other words, I think the urbanism is actually more important than a green roof. Right, so we want to uh, create an exclusion or an exemption for it. No, he's no, saying no. Saying not. Should well, still in other words, be a the, roof the, the, point, the point of the minimum height is is to create a street edge, and so the green roof, which is kind of a private act, shouldn't. You should still create good urbanism, a good street wall. The minimum, yeah. You're, if, am I understanding you correctly? You're saying that a, a second story would be more important than a one-story building with a green roof. Yes. yes. I would agree with that. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take okay. position okay. for now. But it just so long as we're aware that mm -hmm. sure. no green roofs unless you're at the full height. Yeah. Speaking of being aware, you have yes, 10 minutes should. before your next yeah. meeting starts. <laughs> okay. I can, uh, before we, sure, I, sure. I have one more sure. thing in this section, 1024. <laughs> um, the sentence, all building entrances shall abide by current state and federal regulations governing handicap accessibility, I think doesn't need to be in there anymore. That was an artifact of something that was in there before and is no longer in there. I don't think it needs to be in there now. It, it confuses the issue. Um, and also in the case so of a depth. You're right that the codes require it even for renovations. So it's, yeah, it's redundant. Yeah. And, and the first part of the second one, uh, of the next sentence, in the case of adapted reuse or renovation of existing buildings, that part I don't think is necessary. We can just say where the first floor is more than five feet, regardless of, of how that happened. I'm lost. Can you give me the reference again? 10.24. 1024. So this is where, 1024. this is where I, I think we can, we okay, can, can or, and should put something in about a half story. So what I would say is, where the first floor is more than five feet from the adjacent sidewalk, any occupied space in regular use below the first floor shall count as a half story for the purpose of determining maximum number of floors. Something like that. I like that, yeah. <clears throat> well, the, that, that you can do that. Um, the original purpose of this was <coughs> to where the ground was in part. Uh, right. Uh, going back to the previous question, where, where the first floor of an existing building is more than? I mean, the presumption is that we're dealing with, you don't build. No, I'm saying, I'm saying you might want to build That's true. Something. If, if you had other accessibility, you could do that. Interesting. Okay. Well, but not up against the sidewalk. Would you w want someone to build something up against the sidewalk where the entrance was five feet above the sidewalk? More than five feet above the sidewalk? Um, because that would r introduce a, r a ramp at the sidewalk, and that would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> this is the back Elevator. bay phenomenon, right? Isn't this sort of the back bay phenomenon uh, that we're talking about here? Maybe. Like brown st brownstones. Yes, where you've got the floor, the ground splits the floors. Well, as long as they can be handicapped accessible, it, the, the owner could decide. I mean, they still would have to put in an elevator or something then, which would be very expensive. I, I'm a little bit worried about defining heights or, or um, mm. floors in two different places, so. Um, so you, you don't like this whole section? Well, let's, let's make the adjustments and, and Hold that thought yeah, yeah. next time when we go through it. Okay. okay, I'm sorry we thank you very much. Didn't get to you. Um, do you have something quick that you want to say? Well, the first thing I would like to say, oh, do I have them up here? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so we understood, this is Melissa Perot from Precinct One. Um, it was my understanding at the last meeting that we were not rezoning North Amherst. I don't know what this is if it isn't rezoning. Um, changing all the heights, the lot coverage, 
and what is zoning if it isn't these kinds of things? This is changing the zoning. Um, and you're calling it design regulations. But nonetheless, it is a change, a significant change in the zoning. They're allowing mm -hmm. um, on the mixed use buildings, there's gonna be ground floor units for residences and um, the height requirements are different and lot coverages are different. It's very, very different from comp as it was before. And I think that constitutes a zoning change, which our town manager said would not happen until we'd had the housing market study, which you yourselves said was not going to happen um, when we made the priorities um, at the planning board meeting, I think on the 6th or something, I can't remember the date, but we set, I heard you set some priorities and the, um, and I confirmed with you then that the Amherst, North Amherst and, and Atkins Corners were, were not going to be dealt with now. If this general bylaw, I mean general design is for the whole town area, then that's affecting Amherst and North and Atkins Corner. So I'm not sure how that jibes. Also, I understood that it was only concerning the non-residential areas, the, you know, designations of the, of the use categories. And yet on the second page here, I mean on the first page really, there's village center rezoning. I mean residents. We've got the, the com, the BN, the BVC, the BO, and the BG, and RVC. I mean, I just don't know how to, how to process this. And then hearing you struggle with this amongst yourselves, the complications, the making things jive back and forth between the various documents that you have, the complications, and this is in process now, it's not going to be anything consistent, I don't think, right up until the last minute. And then to expect residences, residents here to be able to digest this stuff, pages and pages of it, and make sense of it back and forth with footnotes that sometimes apply and sometimes don't. And, and it is, it's, this is, your job should be to simplify zoning in my view, not to complicate it. This is another layer of complication. We need to be clear about what we're doing. This is not making it clear. What it seems to be doing is, is allowing some developers to do what they want. Um, when I bought my house on an RM property, I did not expect to be able to go out and say, well, actually, I'd like to put a shop here. You know, can we, can we change my zoning to have a shop here? You know, no, I did not expect that. And I wouldn't expect anybody else to. And I don't expect the zoning to be changed just because some developers find it difficult, I suppose, to do what their zoning allows them. We need the, the mixed zoning, uh, mixed use zoning, and we need it the way it is. And to, to create something else in its place seems very backhanded, I am sorry to use that word, but it does seem that way, and it is certainly confusing to uh, taxpaying residents of this town who are trying to understand what is going on. Um, it really is, and it, it seems like an almost an insult to us in a way, and I, I'm sorry to use that word too, but it feels like um, you're overwhelming us on purpose. I mean, we've got this health and safety bylaw, which is huge and important, um, and surely that's enough for people to deal with and to comprehend and to work with without having to go into all of this. What we need in this North Amherst area is a planning to go on. We need the planning part first. We don't need to start with the zoning. I love what Connie said the other day about, you know, maybe we need to go into some spot zoning in order to get some infill. Yes, maybe that's what you need to do, but not this huge thing again. It really is too much. And it, and it, it, its effect will be different in all the different places in town too, this general design regulations. We've got unique communities, but you want a general design regulation. I, I'm, I'm bewildered by it, frankly bewildered. And I, I would ask you, without any hope that this will happen, that you simply not do it. Thank you. They want to respond? Oh, I can respond, sure. So I, I, think, so th I think your comments are, are, are definitely interesting. They, they, it's, a, it's definitely a... a 
a view that a lot of people have, but I don't think it's a view that everyone has. And, and I also think that um, in part, there, in part y your views were, your statements were conflicting. You asked for simplification, then you asked not to do a, a generalization. And so I, I, and furthermore, I think um, um, regardless of how complicated it is or isn't, um, if we, unless we think that, that everything is perfect, which I don't, um, and I don't think most people think that everything is perfect, um, some change will have to be made. All we're doing is, is starting the process of figuring out how to make the change. There is no guarantee that we will actually recommend these articles for this town meeting, but if we don't start now, um, you know, if we wait until August to start, then you'll say, well, there's not enough time for, before fall time meeting. So we're starting now to, f to try and figure out how to make our existing zoning work better. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I think your comments are, are, are good. I'm, I'm definitely listening to them, but I, but I, I think I've, I've heard from other people that, that um, and having been a member of the master plan committee for, for a number of years, I definitely heard the need for a different kind of vision, a different way of approaching things. So, I think actually um, I can understand Ms. Perot's concern, uh, but you have to understand, and I encourage you to read the front of of this, that what what this is is a bunch of pieces from the previous effort, sort of stuck together with some things left out. Um, what the board, what the subcommittee did tonight was to take about half of it out. So this is this was the first time they actually had sat down together and sunk their teeth into what this might at some point become. And I think their intent all along has been to make this uh, simpler, less cumbersome, easier to understand, uh, and as you, I invite you, as I know you will, <laughs> uh, to, to watch the process and see how it, how it proceeds. I think we'll end up with something that's considerably less complex than what we started out with, because we're starting, remember what we're, you know perfectly well what we're starting out with. This is that large, unwieldy document that combined design regulations and use regulations and, and everything. I think what we're going to end up with is something that is clearer uh, that applies to existing zoning districts, that makes fewer changes, that addresses things that people will generally agree upon. But at this point, we're just, we're just, it's sort of the initial sorting. We're pulling some of the kitchen sinks off the table. I, I don't know. We know that it is, but, but we're not sure. We don't know. I just want to respond. I know we're, we're up against the planning board start time. So, um, Ms. Pro, I really respect um, what you've expressed and you've hung in there, you've been at a lot of our meetings, so you know a lot of this stuff, and so I really appreciate any feedback, because if you're thinking that, I think other people have those questions, but I, I really need to clarify, for me, I'm not doing this because a developer asked us to do this. I get informed by what developers share, and what citizens share, and what neighbors share, so that's never, uh, my motivation is to try to make the town the best possible. We may all have different views of what that is. We did say we weren't going to do village center rezoning, but instead we were going to change the BL com dimensions. They are in village in the BVC. That's different than our decision to not do a village center overlay like we have done at previous town meetings. And the planning board asked specifically that we pull back our work plan because it was not manageable or they didn't think it was manageable for the subcommittee. So instead of doing both the dimensional you know, changes that we discussed tonight and Village Center overlay, we're not doing that. So yes, we are making changes or going to propose, if it gets all the way to town meeting, changes in the Village Center, but we're not doing the Village Center overlay district rezoning. So that might have been confusing and what we were working on tonight for the general um, design guidelines this is the first time we've had a discussion of the draft so yeah it was confusing we've never even gone through the language there's a lot of 
questions. It may or may not be ready for spring. I, I, we don't know. It is a messy, it's very confusing. I'm getting, you know, by the end, I, I have a sort of spaghetti brain with it. But we're doing it in good faith, and it may be ready for spring. It may not. Um, clearly, if many people come to the public hearing and think we're not there yet, we'll have to take that into full consideration. But I just wanted to be clear about our motivations, most particularly. Agreed. Okay, uh, we are past time. Sorry about that. Um, Sorry to go on. <laughs>